Well, let's uh, get into our scripture for today. It's uh, from Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Jesus says, Everybody who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise builder who built a house on bedrock. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and beat against that house. It didn't fall because it was firmly set on bedrock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice will be like a fool who built a house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and beat against the house. It fell and was completely destroyed. Well, we pick up today kind of where we left off last week with Jesus. Remember, he was uh, preparing to leave the earth and giving his last instructions. And he told his disciples, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And that's the end of the book of Matthew. And you know, really, you look through Acts and uh, the book of Acts and, and you see that his disciples did a pretty good job, really, at, at what he told them to do. I mean, but, and there's a but here, if you pay attention to the 12 disciples during that time when Jesus is with them for three years, you got to be a little skeptical of the plan. I mean, you got to wonder, is this going to turn out? If you don't know the end of the story, if you don't know what happens to the church and everything, you wonder, man, these guys, they're kind of slow learners. Not the sharpest pencils in the box there, you know. They just, they just don't get it. When they do get it, sometimes they lose it pretty quickly. Uh, one time after uh, they'd been with Jesus for quite a while, uh, no doubt thinking that it was their time to represent him, I mean, he sent them out and they, they did pretty well. Uh, it's in Luke 9. Luke 9 is a huge chapter uh, in, in the Bible. It's got a whole lot of stuff in it. They go out and they preach and they heal and they take authority over the enemy. And, you know, it's like their apprenticeship is moving along pretty good, you know. And then it's all this stuff, you know, um, in, in Luke 9 follows that. Some powerful things, the feeding of the multitude, you know, where Jesus is preaching and it gets late. And um, Jesus looks at them. He says, well, what are you guys going to do? Remember that? And they go out and they find a boy. It's got a few little sardines and some pita bread. And Jesus blesses it and it feeds the whole multitude. And then um, God reveals to Peter that Jesus isn't just a prophet, but he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And, you know, Jesus gives him a fist bump and they go, wow, man, you're the dude. And uh, but, but right after that, this is what I mean, like if you pay attention, right after that, some of these same disciples, they, they get by themselves and they start having this discussion about which one of us is the best. Who, who, who's number one disciple, you know? And you go, wow, these guys, I don't know, Jesus. Uh, you're entrusting your mission to reach all the nations of the world and these guys, you know? I, I'm not sure this is going to... Uh, turn out, and then they're they're getting ready to go down to Jerusalem, to Judea, from up in Galilee. And you know, if most of you know this, the Samaritans were the people that the Jews didn't really care much for. They were kind of off-breed Jews, they thought, and they lived in the middle. And so you couldn't just go from Galilee straight through Samaria. You normally went around Samaria because those were bad people. But Jesus says, I'm going to go through Samaria. So he sends out some disciples and tells them, I want you to go out and make arrangements for me. And, of course, in those days, if, if a traveler is coming through your city, um, you had to give them food and lodging. You had to give them hospitality. So Jesus doesn't just want to, you know, knock on their door and drop in. So he sends a delegation out, and he tells them, you go make some arrangements. So they, they go to the Samaritans, and Samaritans go, no, man, we're not giving, you know, you can just go around. Well, he's not, we don't want him. He's not coming through here. So the disciples, they, they go back, and what they say to Jesus is like, man, where would you get these guys? They say, would you like for us to command fire from the sky to come down and destroy them all? <laughs> it's like, have you done that before? <laughs> you know? 
Is this something you normally do to people as you just fire from the sky, destroy the city? You know, wouldn't you love to see the look on Jesus' face that day as he, you know, they try that out with him? And he goes, oh, gee, you know, wow. The whole world, these guys are going to. And he says, you know, I, I like the way the message puts this because in, in the other translations it says that he's disgusted with them. And, and the message, he actually has dialogue and he says, of course not, you know. And I, you know, this is my own little personal translation here of what's going on. I think Jesus reaches around behind these two guys, grabs their t-shirt, pulls it up over their heads, you know, or maybe gives them head noogies or something like that because they are totally off base as to who he is and what this mission is. But you get the picture. Not the most promising of students, especially when you consider what's at stake, the plan of God for the world in the hands of these guys. Now, some people might think that my comments when I'm talking about St. Peter and St. Philip, that this is kind of irreverent, you know. But it's accurate. you got to admit that. It is accurate. And what God does in these guys' lives is absolutely remarkable when you pay attention to that they are just human beings like us. These are the kinds of things that we would do, right? That we, we would not follow hard on and get everything, you know, follow, follow with everything that we are all the time, but there would be times when we would just, you know, lose it. So today we're going to talk about who is a disciple. Um, a disciple um, in the Greek is a pupil or a learner. That's what it literally means. And in the Greek and the Jewish world, this was, they had, had, had kind of a system of discipleship. Uh, philosophers, Greek philosophers would take uh, disciples, if you were an Epicurean philosopher, uh, uh, a Plato philosopher, um, Aristotle, you would choose some young men, and they were always men, who would follow you and you would teach them and you would teach them this body of knowledge, and they would then grow up and choose others, and that is how it would be passed on. This was the academy of the, of the day. And for the Jewish people, it was rabbis. A rabbi would choose a few young men, usually in their teens, and these young men would then follow this rabbi, and he would teach them about the law, the, the Jewish law, and they would in turn grow up and be rabbis who would choose other young men. And that was the, the system of discipleship that was in the first century at this time. So when Jesus begins his ministry, we see that he, he does the same thing, and uh, first, he ch chooses 12 men, and uh, they live with him daily. He trains them. He teaches them about this new kingdom that he has brought. And they call him rabbi or master. Jesus is most often called rabbi or master. That is who he is. That's the role that he has. And uh, both of these words uh, are relevant, meaning uh, to terms of someone who is teaching, leading others, and that title tells us a lot about how Jesus launched uh, the greatest movement that the world has ever known. So let's talk a little bit about the method. Uh, his method was very simple. Uh, he chose people by challenging and inviting them um, to devote their lives, to be a, a pupil, a learner, who then would teach others the same thing and he really challenged them to join him in everyday life as he taught them what the Father was like. The first thing is, is that I want to point out to us is that he gave them access. This was a, a lengthy process. This was not a short course. This was a long process. They didn't go to a class. He was the class. Life was the class. They observed everything that he did. They observed the way that he interacted with people. They observed the way that he talked. They observed his inner life. They saw him at prayer. They also saw him steal away to be by himself for prayer. He gave them the parables, which uh, we still have, little powerful stories with you know, a punchline, uh, a proverb usually that's at the end of it, something that's memorable. And for th every day for three years, they lived with him and they learned with him. 
And we, we might call this community, but actually it's, it's really closer to a family. And if you look closely at, at the story and see some of this kind of strange things that happen, you know, it's really like some of our families even. Because, the, again, they don't always get it. And sometimes there's a few rough places. And Jesus functions in this family like the elder son. He's the leader. And he functions, the elder son would have responsibility for the family. And that's how he functions. Um, you know, there's times, though, like I said, when, when he gets kind of frustrated with them. It's kind of like our families, you know, uh, with the 12 is, and, and also with others. Um, the word disciple is not just used for 12 disciples. The word disciple is used for a greater body of people that are following beyond the 12 disciples slash apostles. But uh, on multiple occasions, Jesus actually says something to them that, in my opinion, is kind of less than cordial. All right? It's just, you know, uh, he doesn't mince words. Um, he shows his frustration um, in the same way in this family, like we might show our frustration sometimes with each other in our families. You know, this is a very real day-in, day-out thing. And one of them that I think of is John 14, 7 uh, to 9, where Jesus gets a, a little less than cordial with Philip. And Jesus says, if you, they're, they're in the upper room, okay, this holy time, they're in the upper room, he's washed their feet, okay? And he says, if you have really known me, you will also know the Father, from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. And Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been with you all this time? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Simple concept. Jesus says, if you know me, you know my father. If you had known my father, you would know me. And Philip says, well, show us the father. And Jesus is like, wow. This is the last night, okay? This is the last night. The, almost the last teaching moment that he has with Philip. And he's been with him for three years every day. And Philip says, show us the father. It's like, oh, wow, you know, Philip, you're just not getting it. And I, I can just hear Jesus saying, wow, where have you been, man? What have you been doing, you know? So when we notice that Jesus gave them full access, we realize that it wasn't, you know, all high fives, chest bumps, you know, feel good, everybody smiling type moments. This is family. This is what this is. And while access or living together sounds good, it has some rubs. There's some times when things aren't real great. But the, the first part of the method is, is that there's access. Discipleship takes time. It can't be rushed. It's really an immersion, you know, in, in life together. And some people get it quickly, and others, like Philip, not so quickly. It takes some time. Now, the second point I want to make here about discipleship is, is that it, there's imitation. The way that they learned, the way that Jesus did it was by imitation. That, that's what it means to follow someone, is to imitate what they're doing in life and to, to go where they are going and to imitate how they do it, to follow him. And really, the, the 12 disciples are kind of apprentices. Um, that's a word that we use, or perhaps internship would be another word that we might be more familiar with. Uh, in the kind of the professional world, in the trade world, we call it apprenticeships, where someone wants to be in a trade union. You will take an apprenticeship, usually for a couple of years, and then you become a journeyman. You get entry into the union, which means you know what you're supposed to be doing, and the way that you learn this usually is a combination of some head knowledge, some book knowledge, but also being assigned to a journeyman as an apprentice who then teaches you what you're supposed to know. Now, I've been an apprentice for three months. I was an apprentice one time. Uh, got out of uh, high school and 
uh, landed a good job as a, it really was a good job, as a window washer in St. Louis. And that was a labor union. So they assigned me to a man, I wish I could remember his name, he was a saint, he really was. Um, but he was uh, uh, kind of a short, mild-mannered, really gentle man, and that's why they gave the five or six apprentices to him, because he was the only one that could put up with us, you know. And they, they assigned us to wash the windows of Brown Foreman Tobacco Company, which some of you heard this story, but it was uh, Brown Foreman. I remember it was a really old kind of warehouse place, and it had, like they did with uh, factories in those days, they would put uh, banks of large windows, six by nine panes, thousands of them along the side of the building. Only problem with this was that since they were handling tobacco, tar completely covered those windows every year. You know, those of you that smoke, you need to go there, you'd stop. But it just completely cover these six by nine windows so they'd give us, you know, razor blades. And the first day on work is this landing this great job as a window washer with good pay, they, you scrape the tar off the windows so you could wash the windows. So you first had to find the glass and we would scrape that off. But the, the method that we went about doing that with our journeyman was that he would show us what to do and we observed Okay, and then he did some more and we helped him, right? And then we, after a period of time, we started doing it and he helped us. And then the last stage was that we did it all on our own. Actually, it only got down to me and one other guy. The other guys dropped out. They didn't like scraping tar off windows. But we were then sent out on our own and this journeyman was getting a little bit of our pay, okay? And he was responsible to the company for us. And so he would either approve or disapprove our work, but he would shadow us and come, ar come along and see how we were doing. So there's the process, okay? He did it, we watched. He did it, we helped. We did it, he helped. We did it, and he cheered, right? And that was our sometimes didn't cheer so much. That was the same method that Jesus used if you look at how he trained his disciples. At first, they just listened. Um, Matthew 5, beginning Matthew 5 through Matthew 7, the whole Sermon on the Mount. It says that he went away with his disciples, not just his 12, but his greater company of disciples, and he taught them. So we have this introduction into the kingdom of God. Matthew 12, the Sermon on the Mount. You know, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, blessed are you when you're persecuted. Uh, blessed are those who mourn. And, and on and on, turn the cheek and all that stuff. But later on then, as he taught, we have the feeding of the multitude, and we find out that they are interacting with the people. They're out there with the multitudes, and they're his representatives, kind of little teachers out there among them. That was the second step. And then they try their hand at uh, kingdom work, and, and he sends them out. He sends the 12 out. And uh, there's one story in, in Matthew 17, uh, kind of late in the story, but where they, they're actually doing this, and a man comes to Jesus, and he has a son who is um, being demonized and casts the boy to the ground. And the man comes with the son and says, uh, we went to your disciples, to your followers, and asked him to cure our son, and they couldn't do it. They, they failed. And Jesus goes, oi, you know, it's like, well, what are we going to do with these guys? And so he, he heals the boy, and then the disciples are kind of standing around going, and they say, why couldn't we do it? We, you know, we said exactly what you said. We did exactly what you did. Well, we followed the plan. We've been watching you and what you did. And we did exactly the same thing, Jesus. What went wrong? And Jesus said, well, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. With faith, everything is possible. Nothing is impossible is actually what he said. And, you know, here they were just saying the words, but they didn't have the faith. And so... You know, there we are on the third step. They try, they fail. Jesus helps them, right? Then we get to the last step. He sends them out 
um, by themselves in verse 12, and then he sends the 70 out in Luke 10. And it says that Jesus stays home when the 70 goes out. He stays home, and it says he rejoices because he sees Satan falling from heaven because they're so successful. So we have all four stages of apprenticeship there in the, in the life of Jesus and his disciples. Imitation. How did Jesus do it? That's the question. How did Jesus do it? The question isn't how are other churches doing it. The question is how did Jesus do it? And, and that's what we need to be attuned to when we're reading the Bible. Then the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is action. We, we can't overstate the, the point that a disciple acts. A disciple of Jesus Christ doesn't just talk, uh, but he has actions like Jesus. Um, we imitate him. Uh, we live life as he lived it. There, there's going to be daily identifiable actions. His disciples will do what he did, and that's what he promised. Remember there in John 14, he says, greater works than what I have done, you will do. Actions, okay? And that's why we began with this Matthew 7 passage, and Jesus said that if we just hear him and don't do anything about it, he said, you're acting like a fool. He says, you're like the guy who goes down to Myrtle Beach and builds his new elaborate home right down there on the sand. No stilts, no rock. You just put it down on the sand, and you go, that's a beautiful home on the sand right down there on the beach. You know, and Jesus says, ah, there's going to be a storm that comes. There's going to be a storm comes in life. And, you know, nobody would do that. That's just too silly. But listening to him and not having actions, he says, is like that. And I'm just so glad that we never, ever do anything like that. Right? We always, always act on everything that we hear Jesus doing. Wow. Sarcasm alert. This is why my house is metaphorically and your house is metaphorically keep blowing down. It's because we, we hear it, but we don't do it. We often live like being a follower of, of, of Jesus, being his disciple, means that we agree with him. <laughs> what good does it do to agree with him if we don't do anything about it? And life comes at it and it blows things down and we go, what in the world happened I love Jesus. I agreed with him. I believe in Jesus. Of course, I didn't make any changes in my life. I didn't follow him. My life is still the same. But I've got this little Jesus segment, you know. And we go, wow, I can't believe this happened to me again. How did this happen? I mean, Jesus says, well, you call me Lord, Lord. Um, but you didn't follow me. You, you lived as if your faith is kind of entertainment or something. You say you believe, but you don't live like you believe. You know, if you want to read some depressing stuff, uh, read the polls that come out occasionally. Uh, Gallup is big about doing them, and Barna is big about doing them. Polls on American Christianity and how our culture is just infected with this disconnect between our actions and, and actually what uh, goes on, what we say. Um, what you'll find is about half the people who say that they are Christians um, don't believe that the Bible is really true, so they don't read it. They just think it's got a bunch of kind of magic stuff and, you know, some old junk in it. And you can't understand it, and everybody argues about it, so we don't really have anything to do with it. And then there's, you, you, in the same data, you find millions who call themselves Christians don't think that Jesus is equal with God. They think that Jesus is, you know, really, really, really good man. But God, no, no, no. No, God tells him what to do, and he does that, and he, and he you know, he's pretty good at it. But he's not really God. And then the, the, the polls say about half of them don't believe that there's such a thing as the Holy Spirit or such a thing as, as evil in the world. And, and now, in the most recent surveys, and this has just happened the last 10 years, about half of professing Christians have a disconnect between what they do with their bodies and their faith. They, they don't see that it's anybody's business whatsoever what they do with their body, especially God doesn't even care. He just wants us to be happy. 
so just do what you want to do. And, you know, those are de depressing things. There's this disconnect between actions and beliefs. And, you know, think about that. What if we treated each other that way? What if we treated each other that we just said some one thing, but we did exactly ex what we, you know, didn't make any difference? I mean, I, I have an imaginary letter from my wife. Sorry, honey. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a fictional account, okay? It's a fictional letter uh, that she wrote to me right after I asked her to marry. And here's, marry me, and here's her reply. Dear Don, I was so excited to receive your letter today, and I want to reply as soon as possible because my heart is about to burst. You can tell I wrote this, can't you? Yeah. Yes, 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 I will marry you. Nothing could make me happier. I will love you forever. However, as you know, I've dated a few guys in the last year and have enjoyed their company a lot. They were never a replacement for you, and I gladly give them up, except for John and Jim. If you don't mind too much, I would like to keep them on as boyfriends after we are married. I, I promise you that you have my heart, but I really think a lot about both of them, and you must know how much I love you because... I've never been willing to give up this many boyfriends before. Oh, and one more thing. I hope you don't mind, but I really prefer not to move to where you are. I love my parents so much, and they mean everything to me. I know that you want me to be happy, and I cannot be happy apart from them. So I will be staying here with the hopes that you will visit often, at least once a week, Sundays, probably. My love forever, Nina. Isn't that a hoot? See, that's so ridiculous. Who, what kind of fool would marry a woman like that? I'll give up seven of my nine boyfriends, you know. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't. Well, the kind of person that would go through with a marriage like that is the same kind of guy that would build his house down in the sand at Myrtle Beach. You know, we would not we would realize that someone that says, I love you, and yet they don't have the actions to go with the I love you, they don't really love me. I'm sorry. You know, we hear all the time that uh, we are to invite Jesus Christ into our hearts. That's not the issue. That's, that's really not the issue here. I mean, disciples of Jesus Christ don't make Jesus Lord. We submit to his lordship. The fact that we believe in him does not make him Lord. He is Lord because he is God, whether we say he is or not. Okay? And he isn't Lord because we invite him into our hearts. He's Lord because he invites us into his life. Live like me. Follow me. And words alone don't build a strong life. Action, living a life that pleases him is a life of action and you know intellectual belief does not save us intellectual belief does not make us disciples action makes us disciples we live like Jesus Jesus's brother in James 2 9 said some words I'm sure you've heard before he says it's good that you believe God is one ha even demons believe this and they tremble with fear sure to believe is one thing to follow is another so here's, here's your question, okay, for, for all of us. Does my life, my actions imitate Jesus? Do my actions imitate Jesus? Does my life imitate Jesus? You know, let me answer that for you, for, for myself first. I would say kind of. Kind of. You know, it's kind of like, like looking at a picture of a, of a baby and saying, oh, yeah, I, I, I can see Grandpa in there. It's kind of in the eyes just a little bit. You know, I think sometimes people look at me and they go, yeah, I, yeah, you, you, you kinda, I can kind of see Jesus in you. Yeah, maybe, you know, there's a little bit of resemblance, right? Is, is, you identify with that? I mean, is that would be your analysis? Do, does your life imitate Jesus? Do people see you, you know, kind of, you know? You ever noticed how older people 
I, I mean really old people, not like me, old people. You ever see people sometimes that the, the couple looks so much alike, they look just like each other? And, and when they started off, they didn't look like each other. And you go, wow, they've been married for 60 years. And look at them. They look like each other. Sorry, Nina. They, they, they look like each other, you know? And, and that's, that's the, kind of, you know, you just kind of grow together. And it's kind of the same thing with Jesus. The longer that we follow him, the more that we look like him. We resemble him if we imitate him. Well... Here's the thing, if you're looking at yourself and you're going, yeah, I kind of look like him, you know, a little bit. I, I got some good news. You're not done. All right, we're not done. Now, nobody's done being a disciple. That's one of the things. You're always in process. There's no such thing as being done with it. it we're following a living person who initiates change in our life constantly. We're, it's, it's unpredictable some, sometimes because you're not really sure what's going to happen. But, but if, you've, if you're yoked with him, if you said, I want to follow you, I want to be in yoke with you, you're going to have some times where you're not really sure, but yet you trust. You trust where you're going. We'll never feel that we fully resemble him because we're always learning. We're always the pupil. There's always change. There's always development. And he wants some voluntary disciples. He'll, he'll never going to force you uh, or impose his will on you. So each new challenge, uh, each new decision, means we have to keep on trusting and following him as a disciple. A disciple is a person in process. And that process begins when a person accepts Christ and we become a learner and we become a pupil. And it continues as long as we will respond as long as we will follow. Now listen, sometimes we stop. Sometimes we stop following. You know? And sometimes he, he challenges us to come deeper and further than what we ever thought that we could go before. And maybe somebody here is in that place right now. And you've just said, I don't want any more. From time to time in this process, Jesus will kind of ups the ante for his learners. And to the growing disciple, he'll say, you know, you've been doing so well. And you've been demonstrating that you really are following after, really a disciple, but now it's time to graduate to the next class. So more is going to be ex expected, you know, to, to him who's received much, much will be, you know, expected. Are you willing to expect or accept that challenge? If the disciple says, yes, I'm willing to learn, well, then you're going to continue to grow. One of the saddest things is to see an older Christian and all that they remember is what used to be back in the day. Back in the day when I was following hard. But somewhere along the line, the challenge became so great. And they said, no, I won't go there. I don't want any more. So what does a disciple do? Accepts the invitation. Okay, spends the time, the access okay, to, to God. Imitates uh, God with action and then never stops. It's a process. So I guess to be just real blunt, I think today uh, God, Jesus, is, is challenging us, inviting us um, to be a disciple, not just a believer, but a follower, a disciple. And maybe it's the first time, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's the first time to move from believing to following and saying, you know, I've been pretending like I could just believe in you and that would change my life and it just hasn't worked. I realize that. Or maybe, maybe you started following years ago and you stopped. Um, maybe it just, something happened, it was just too great of a challenge for you and you stopped. Well, today's the day to get back. Today's the day to accept the challenge and say, you know, I trust you. I trust what you're going to do. Let's, let's sit in prayer with that for a minute. Your heart in the streams of life 
Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of His mercy. As deep cries out.